Today in the study of world literature, we focus on writing about literature. Professor Nancy Stefan Fleur challenges us to think about writing. She begins autobiographically, telling us about her own history of reading, a pleasure, and writing, something else again, about literature. We don't have to feel overwhelmed when we are asked to write about literature, she tells us. She explores this strategy in a book, creating an inclusive college curriculum, in which she coins a phrase called voiced writing. She asks us to reconsider our ideas about ourselves as writers and readers. And she then applies her ideas of getting us to look at a poem, Musée de Beaux by North American writer W.H. Auden, in a highly personal way, stressing not what we should think about in terms of pleasing an instructor, but instead what we should think about in terms of making the poem meaningful to us. She then asks us to deepen our understanding of the poem by looking at the painting Icarus by the Flemish painter Peter Bruegel. Welcome back to World Lit. In this session, I want to work with you on a problem that drives most students crazy, namely how to write about literature. When I was in college, I usually did the course reading as soon as it was assigned. Reading was a pleasure. It was fun. Writing was a different thing. Writing was an obligation, a have to, a performance that would be judged by somebody else. When a teacher would assign a paper due three or four weeks in the future, I would say, well, that's a long time off. I don't have to think about that now. And I wouldn't. Then as the deadline neared, I would start to get nervous. I knew that I should be getting organized, doing a rough draft. But I put it off and I put it off until finally the night before the paper was due, I would sit down at the typewriter and stare at the blank piece of paper that was rolled up inside it. What should I write? What did my teacher want? How should I begin? There was so little time left, and I always felt overwhelmed. I assume that some of you, at least, have had a similar experience. It's pretty unpleasant, that feeling of being overwhelmed. But it doesn't have to be that way. Over the years, I've developed a strategy for taking a lot of the anxiety and pain out of writing about literature. And I'd like to share that strategy with you today. The first thing you need to do is to reconsider your understanding of what reading and writing are. Most of us tend to think that reading and writing are very separate things. First you read something, then later you write about it. But this isn't necessarily true. Good writers are active readers. Active readers are people who are continuously having a conversation with themselves about what they are reading. They begin that conversation the moment they open a book, and they begin writing down their reactions in their journals or notebooks as they read, as they read. They're writing for themselves, not for somebody else, so they don't have to worry about making mistakes. They are writing to learn, to explore their own feelings and reactions to a text, a poem, a novel, a short story. Later on, they can explain their reactions to somebody else, a teacher, a friend, even your parent. But first, people have to get those reactions down on paper without being uptight about being wrong. In the second half of this lesson, I'm going to give you some tips on how to explain your ideas to your teacher effectively. Right now, however, I simply want to show you how to become a more active reader, how to write to learn so that when you finally sit down to write your essay, you will not only know what you want to say, but much more importantly, you will have something to say that you really care about, something that means something to you. In order to help you become a more active reader, I'm going to take you through the poem that you saw on the screen at the beginning of this tape. We're going to take a little closer look at the picture you saw a little later, too. The poem is called Musée des Beaux-Arts by W.H. Auden. It appears on page 584 of the anthology we are using in this course 
called One World of Literature. That's this book, page 584. In a minute, um, I am going to ask you to pause the tape and actually read that poem. You will also need to get some writing materials, a pen or a pencil, some paper, or better yet, a notebook in, that you use exclusively for this course. And that's a very good idea, to have a notebook you use just for this course. If you're comfortable with using a word processor, um, the best idea actually is to turn on your computer and open a file in which you can save the writing I will be asking you to do in this lesson, and all your other world writing as well. Some people strongly prefer to write by hand, and that's OK. But using a word processor from the very beginning will make it easier for you to share your reactions with other distance learning students via the online conference system. Uh, you will also be able to transform your notes into a rough draft of an essay without having to retype everything all over again. Once you get the writing materials ready, I want you to do the following two things. First, read the poem Musée de Beaux-Arts on page 584 of your book. Second, spend five minutes writing down your reactions to the poem, your feelings about it. In particular, um, what do you think about it? What does it mean to you? Were there any parts of the poem that puzzled you? Are there any parts of the poem that made you think of your own experience? When you finish writing, turn on the tape again. I'll be waiting for you. Welcome back. Let's begin again. If you were here with me in this classroom, and I wish you were, I might ask you to read what you've written and to listen to what other students have written. We wouldn't be looking for right or wrong answers, but merely for possibilities to explore. Sharing your reactions and questions with other students in a non-judgmental way is an important part of being an active reader. You can do some of this kind of sharing with fellow distance learning students via the online conference system associated with this course, but you will also have to learn how to create a conversation with yourself about what you're, what you're reading. One of the underlying principles in this lesson is that readers make meaning. Let me explain. If you've ever gone on a camping trip, you probably took some dehydrated food with you. And yet, of course, it's not really food, not until you add water and stir. Literature is a little like that. A book that sits on a library shelf and nobody ever checks it out or reads it is just an inert object. It's a thing. It's only when somebody takes it out and reads it that literature happens. It is your interactions with the text that make it come alive. Does that mean that any opinion about what a text means is as good as any other? Mm, yes and no. If the police interview 12 witnesses to a traffic accident, they're going to get 12 rather different stories about what happened because no two people are ever in exactly the same position at the same time, and no two people are ever exactly the same. Further, our observation is always filtered through our previous life experience. To an astounding degree, we see only what we expect to see, and yet they're common denominators. There's always a basis for consensus. For example, if you summarize the Auden poem, Musée de Beaux-Arts, by saying that it's about elephants, I would certainly support your right to have such an opinion. But at the same time, I might challenge you to explain what led you to this conclusion. I might ask you to point out some elephant references in the text. Let's look at the text itself for a moment, not searching for elephants, but searching for clues. Imagine that a text, not merely this poem, but every poem, story, and novel is a kind of murder mystery site, a locked room in which something strange and mysterious has taken, mysterious has taken place. Then imagine that you are the great fictional detective Sherlock Holmes and that you've been called in by the police to investigate this mystery. When Sherlock enters a murder mystery room, he always has with him a notebook and a pen in order to record his observations. 
and he's usually accompanied by his friend, Dr. Watson, who writes up Sherlock's cases for the general public once Sherlock has solved the mystery. We're going to talk more about Watson later on. The first thing that Sherlock does when he enters a locked room mystery site is look around. He gets down in his belly and he crawls under the furniture with his magnifying glass. He climbs up and inspects the ceiling. He looks at anything and everything. There's an old saying that God is in the details. Sherlock pays attention to details. Even the smallest thing might be important. Later on, he will gradually eliminate most of those details as being unimportant and focus in on the few de details that are important and then start to make a web of connections between them. But first, he simply tries to take in as much as possible, noting especially those things that puzzle him or startle him or make him think. You need to do the same thing yourself every time you begin to interact with a text. God is in the details. Take them in, write them down, and begin to play with them. Human beings learn by playing. Let's spend a few minutes now going over the Auden poem detail by detail, looking for anything that might be a clue. Literature, indeed all writing, is essentially linear. Poems, stories, and novels have beginnings, middles, and ends. They exist in time. We know from surveys that people tend to pay most attention to what is the, at the very beginning and at the very end of a piece of writing. When you come to write your own essay, you want to take advantage of this fact and put your main idea at the beginning, where it's most likely to be noticed, and then restate it at the end. What did Auden put at the beginning of his poem and why? Because you are Sherlock Holmes and a very good observer, you probably noticed that there is something rather strange and puzzling about the title. Although the poem is written in English, the title is not in English. Is this an important clue? If so, what does it mean? Before we investigate that clue, let's look at another much less obvious anomaly at the beginning of the poem. The first sentence does not end at the first line, but wraps around in the, into the beginning of the second line. Although the phrasing of the poem is straightforward and almost conversational, at least for poetry, the word order is not quite normal. Usual English sentences begin with the subject, followed by the verb, followed by the object. Thus, we might expect this sentence to read, the old masters were never wrong about suffering. Who are those old masters, anyhow? There may be formal reasons for Auden's choice of syntax having to do with rhythm. Unlike stories or novels, poetry is an oral meaning, medium. That is, it's meant to be read out loud, to be heard. Sound is as important as the sense sometimes. Indeed, sometimes sound is inseparable from sense. However, we might also notice that Auden's choice of word order has the effect of putting two words into a very conspicuous place up front. The two words are about suffering. In beginning this way is Auden stating the hidden subject of his poem. In what ways is this poem about suffering and its human position? We don't know the answer yet, but we want to write down every potential clue in our notebook. And this may be an important one. I don't have time to take you through the entire poem in its rich detail, so I want to skip down to the last eight lines and look at them very closely, the lines that begin in Bruegel's Icarus. I suspected many of you marked these words and commented on them as puzzling. Let's play with them in conjunction with the two clues we marked earlier, the non-English title and the opening phrase about suffering. You began by writing down your reactions to this poem without worrying whether they were right or wrong, and you continued by doing a little Sherlocking, looking for details that might be important clues. Now I want you to enter a new phase of active readership by doing some investigation and research. Many of you may already know that the title of this poem is written in French, so that it translates as the Museum of Fine Arts. Fine arts meaning painting and sculpture. If you didn't know this, how could you have found it out? By asking your teacher, your fellow students, by email or the online conference associated with this course, by consulting a, an encyclopedia, including the CD-ROM encyclopedia, by going to the library, any number of ways. But you have to be active, proactive. Why does Auden title this poem the Museum of Fine Arts? If we would go to the trouble of reading a biography of Auden, or more simply if you asked your teacher, 
you might discover that Auden visited the Musée Royal de, de Beaux-Arts in Brussels Belgium, Brussels, Belgium in 1938, two years before he wrote this poem. There's another way to locate this particular Museum of Fine Arts as well, however, a way that's hidden in the poem itself. The word Bruegel is obviously a name. We could guess that. So is the word Icarus. Moreover, since the word Icarus is in, is in italics, it may be a title. Look these words up in virtually any encyclopedia or dictionary, and you will discover several interesting facts. One, that Peter Bruegel was a Flemish painter who lived from about 1525 to 1569. Two, that major European painters of this period are often referred to as old masters. Three, that Icarus was the son of the legendary Greek inventor Daedalus, who, when escaping from Crete on artificial wings made for him by his father, ignored his father's warnings and flew so close to the sun that the wax by which his wings were fastened melted so that he fell into the sea and was drowned. And finally, four, that the old master Peter Bruegel painted a painting entitled The Fall of Icarus, a painting which is housed in the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Brussels, Belgium. The games of foot, as Sherlock liked to say, equipped with these facts were hot on the trail. The next thing to do, obviously, is to locate a copy of Bruegel's picture. I've saved you the trouble of hunting it down, and I'm going to show it to you now. Put on your Sherlock cap, take a very close look at it, and record your responses in your notebook. Remember that God is in the details. I'll wait for a few seconds while you do that. Later on, you may want to locate a copy of this picture in your library and study it more closely. For now, let's take a quick look at it together and comment on one of several puzzling things about it. First, where is Icarus? His fall is the apparent subject of the painting, so we naturally expect him to be big and in the center of the picture, but he's not. Indeed, we have to look very closely to see him at all. I'll show you where he is. Why did Bruegel make this strange artistic choice? Let's go back to the poem and see what W.H. Auden thought. Reading Auden after seeing Bruegel's Fall of Icarus painting, we now realize that the last eight lines of the poem describe the painting. But they don't really describe it passively. They add Auden's commentary, his interpretation. Moreover, the words, for instance, in line 16 suggest that this painting, or at least Auden's interpretation of it, is being used as an example to support a generalization. We need to go back and reread the entire poem again, beginning with the opening line about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters. Obviously, your task is much more complicated than it seemed at first, but also potentially much more interesting now as well. You are going to write down your reactions to W.H. Auden's reactions to Bruegel's painting, The Fall of Icarus, a painting which itself is a reaction to an ancient story about a defiant boy and his father, a story about something strange, something wonderful, something terrible all at once. In writing your final paper, you will be expressing your thoughts and feelings as an individual located in a particular time and place and shaped by a particular life experience. But your response is also part of a kind of chain letter that goes back to the very beginnings of human history. You are separate, but also connected. In writing about this poem, you enter into not only a dialogue with yourself, but also a dialogue with people you've never met, a dialogue with your civilization, a dialogue with your ancestors. What you add to this dialogue, to this long chain letter, is important. Now you will have many more questions than you did before and deeper questions. For instance, why does Bruegel place the plowman at the center of the picture? Why is the plowman not turning to look at Icarus? Why does Auden describe the ship as delicate and expensive? What might these features have to do with the ship's uh, indifference, apparently, to Icarus's fall? How does nature react or not react if Icarus is suffering? How would you respond if you saw a boy falling out of the sky? What if you saw a more ordinary kind of accident? How would you respond to that? These questions are merely pump priming suggestions. There are many more questions you can and should ask yourself and your teacher and your fellow students. 
the description of the Icarus painting only occupies the last eight lines of the poem, for instance. What other lines? What are the other lines about? Are there other Bruegel paintings in the Musée de Beaux-Arts that Auden might have seen? Are there good things mentioned in this poem as well as bad things? Does it mean anything that Auden wrote this poem in 1940 at the beginning of the Second World War? And so on. There's much more to be said about this poem, much more that you can discover and react to. The point is that you don't want to wait passively for your teacher to ask questions or to tell you what it all means. Um, you want to invent your own questions and your own answers. You want to be an active reader and a proactive writer from the very beginning. In the brief time remaining, I want to give you some specific pointers about how you can turn your proactive journal writing and Sherlock-style note-taking into an effective essay. Sherlock Holmes is primarily interested in the challenge of solving the mystery. He works for his own satisfaction. He doesn't really care what other people think, or so he says. Thus, it's up to Sherlock's friend, Dr. Watson, to explain each case so that everybody can understand it. Having played the role of Sherlock the investigator in the first phase of your literary detective work, now you need to play the role of Watson. At the end of every case, Sherlock explains the solution to the mystery. He tells the police not only who did it, but how he figured out who did it. Then Watson takes Sherlock's explanation and he puts it in story form, beginning at the beginning, so that anybody who picks up the book can understand what the case is all about, who the main characters were, when it took place. And most importantly, the reasoning process that allowed Sherlock to solve the puzzle. You need to do the same thing, not only for this particular Musée de Beaux-Arts case that we've been working on, but for every work of literature that you write about. You need to explain what's going on in the text as you understand it and explain how you arrived at your conclusions. You need to provide evidence for everything you say. You need to describe your own reasoning processes and you need to anticipate questions and objections that others may make and answer these objections and questions in advance. When you're working with the, uh, the text in your journal, you only had to satisfy yourself. Now you need to inform and persuade other people. In the final minutes of this lesson, I want to quickly run through some of the most common questions my students ask me about writing essays in literature class. The first question is often a rel relatively plaintive one. That is, people say, how long should my paper be? What students are really saying is that they are afraid of writing. They are afraid that they won't have enough words to fill up the bag that I've given them. But an essay is not a bag of words. No piece of writing is. Auden's poem consists of 174 words. But these words haven't been scattered on the page like sand. They've been carefully arranged and connected to each other in a deliberate design in order to convey a point, several points, in fact. A work of literature is like a house. It has structure. It has load-bearing members. It has entrances and exits. It has been built to, to last. It's been put together. And your essay needs to be like that, too. It needs to be built. And your Sherlock style, in, in your Sherlock-style investigations, you've taken Auden's little house apart, piece by piece, now you need to put it back together again, adding some new materials of your own, your feelings, your reactions. And you need to explain your composite construction to other people. In other words, you have to write until you get to the end. How long your paper needs to be depends on the complexity of the work you're discussing, the complexity of your responses to it, and also how much background material you need to put in in order for other people to understand what you're talking about. Most teachers will give you a minimum and maximum word count when making a writing assignment, but these are merely guidelines to help you prioritize your thought. In a short paper, you can only focus on a few very important ideas. You have to get right to the point. In a longer paper, you have to add, you, you can add more supporting details. You can digress a bit. You can actually play a bit and have more fun. Ironically, although students tend to worry more about longer papers, short papers are actually more difficult to write. To say a little about anything, you really have to know what you're talking about. Another question that students frequently ask is, how do I begin? There's an old rule in business and technical writing that says, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. This approach works well for writing about literature, too. In other words, you purposely build redundancy into the structure of your essay so that your reader will get several chances to see your main point. But what if you don't know what your main point is when you start to write? 
Some people have to know what the first sentence is before they can begin. Some people have to make a complete outline of their essay before they feel in control. And this is a good idea, like making a blueprint before you start to build a house. But not everybody's mind works this way. Some people think more intuitively and need to discover their own ideas in the process of writing. The most important thing is to know who you are and to trust your way of doing things. Journal writing is useful for everybody in generating raw materials, um, but then you have to follow your own style. If you can't begin in the beginning, then begin in somewhere else, begin in the middle. A great many writers do this very thing. They start with a seed image that they can't get out of their mind, and they just write about that, and the story or poem builds itself around that seed image like uh, a pearl builds itself around a piece of grit and an oyster. And you can start in the middle. If you have a word processor, it's really easy because you can build your essay in chunks and then simply re you know, kind of shuffle and rearrange them without having to retype. Another question that students ask is, can I use I when I write my paper? What they really mean is, who should I try to sound like? If I'm writing for my English teacher, shouldn't I try to sound like an English teacher? This is a really important question, and I want to make my answer absolutely emphatic. Yes, by all means, use I, and no, don't try to sound like an English teacher. Try to sound exactly like yourself. Use your own voice. Years ago, literary critics tried to write objectively and impersonally, almost if they were scientists discussing some scientific phenomenon. They never used I, and they tried to keep their personal feelings out of things. Um, but this has changed. Today we know that readers make meaning. It's impossible to keep your re personal reactions out of a textual analysis, so why even try to do so? Um, the best approach is perhaps to imagine that you're explaining your ideas to your readers in person as if they were actually in the room with you. If you do this, if you write your papers in your own natural voice, you will find that many of your writing problems will actually disappear. After all, it's very difficult to write clearly about your own reactions and ideas when at the same time you're also trying to do an impersonation of an English teacher. So cut it out to yourself. Finally, you might ask, who am I writing for? Actually, students don't ask this question as often as they should. They assume they're writing for their teacher alone. This is a strategic mistake, however, and leads to a lot of problems. Because you're, what you're writing is important to you, because you're part of your own essay, you want to make sure that your insights are available to the widest possible audience. You may want to give your essay later on to your friends or your, even your parents and be confident that they will know what you're talking about. Your teacher knows the assignment, that's true. She knows their subject matter, but other people may not. Thus, in your introduction, you want to make sure you explain your topic. You want to be Watson now and not Sherlock. You want to set the scene. You want to orient your readers. Remember, tell them what you're going to tell them before you tell them what you tell them. As long as you care about what you're doing, none of this is very difficult. Writing itself will become easier and easier and more natural as you go along. The important thing, as I said in the beginning, is to be an active reader and a proactive writer to get yourself into everything that you write, to be honest, straightforward, to say what you think, to present your case in the most passionate and persuasive language possible. If you write in this way, in your own voice, your teacher will hear you. More importantly, you will be able to hear yourself. Good student writers become increasingly conscious about their assertions as they develop their voices. They are willing to consider and reconsider their ideas during the process of writing and reading. Indeed, the process of writing and reading is a recreation. The author, in this case, Auden, has tried to guide our responses, but our own experiences contribute to those responses. As Sylvan Barnett writes in the handbook, A Short Guide to Writing About Literature, when you think about meaning, you're thinking about what the author was trying to say and do. For instance, take an old theme, treat it in a new way. When you think about significance, you are thinking about what the work does for you, enlarges your mind. There are contemporary critical approaches to literature, and these too may be helpful in getting you to think about literature in inspired ways. There is formalism, a point of view that sees the work as an independent creation, something to be studied not as part of a larger context, the author's life or the time the author lived, but as a work of art to be analyzed in itself. There's archetypal criticism, a kind of analysis that takes into account 
the hypothesis of Swiss psychologist Carl G. Jung that there is a collective unconscious, a set of collective experiences common to all cultures. There is historical scholarship that sees the work in the context of time in which it was written. And there's Marxist criticism that sees the work of literature in terms of its beliefs and its ideology, and which often judges the work of literature on what it does not say and on what classes of people are not represented. There's biographical criticism, which sets a work within the life of its author. And there is psychoanalytic criticism, which asks us to look at the work as a manifestation of psychology. And there is feminist criticism, which asks us to look at the ways that gender informs the ways that literature is written and read. Yet, as Dr. Stefan Flores' lecture demonstrates, these methods tend to be used as needed rather than as distinct frames of reference that place blinders on students. A final note. The kind of voice writing that Dr. Stefan Flores advocates is especially appropriate to the study of oral literature. As Mario Vargas Llosa writes in his essay, Social Commitment in the Latin American Writer, in Peru, in Bolivia, in Nicaragua, to be a writer means to assume a social responsibility. At the same time that you develop a personal literary work, you should serve through your writing, but also through your actions as an active participant in the solution of the economic, political, and cultural problems of your country. As you will see in the many of the readings in this course, the sense of personal responsibility is important to the passion of these writers as they present their ideas. If you're willing to respond on a personal level and to write your papers in your own natural voice, to write things that matter, you'll be in a much better position to understand world literature.